again. I'm Mike Hogue of Lily House Permaculture, and this time we're going to be talking about guilds. Guilds are plantings that are designed to work like ecosystems, which means that we get the plants to take care of each other, which saves us work. All of those jobs that we typically do around the garden, those things that take our time and energy, such as weeding and watering and fertilizing and dealing with pests, helping with pollination, all of these things can be substituted for with plants. We can pick plants that will help the overall holistic health of our plantings and at the same time do this work for us that we need to get done so that we don't have to do it. Win-win, right? Now, in a real ecosystem, each plant may do 10, 15 different jobs to help the, the health of the ecosystem. It may have interactions that help host organisms that contribute to the health of the ecosystem in ways that we can't even understand. But we can understand some things and see how they work in a natural ecosystem. So we can start by filling those guild roles and hoping that they're going to get us a good start. And at the same time, then, next, we can make sure that we're using lots of biodiversity in what we're planting to try to fill in some of those other unseen roles that we can't understand. So we'll be starting with about a half a dozen guild roles, which is what I usually use. It's a nice, simple way of thinking about it, a nice number. The ones that we're going to be dealing with are nitrogen fixers, dynamic accumulators, insectary plants, both for pollinators and predatory insects, mulch maker plants, ground covers including walkable ground covers, and fortress plants that help maintain the boundaries of the ecological unit that we're creating. So let's take a look at some of those plants and some of those roles. One of the first and most important jobs in any garden is maintaining the fertility of the system. And the most important nutrient that we have to worry about is nitrogen. Because nitrogen is water soluble and it's one of the most, uh, one of the quickest to run out in a system and get depleted in the soils. So it's a major limiting factor to the productivity of a garden. Luckily, natural ecosystems have a perfect solution for this, which is nitrogen-fixing plants. So let's look at what some of these nitrogen fixers are. Actually, right here in this little bit of garden where I'm sitting, we have four different nitrogen fixers within a few feet of me. So let's check those out. So the first we have here in this guild is a very beautiful blue false indigo with its pea like seed pods just forming because it is another legume like most legumes that is a nitrogen fixer and it's one that we have planted in here we chop and drop it to help maintain the fertility and every time we chop it those roots die back in the soil releasing their nitrogen for other plants to be able to use and behind me whoop, we have an Eliagnus we have two species here we have Gumi and we have autumn olive, which is something that we have being here in the city in an area that's surrounded by autumn olive. We don't feel like we're introducing anything that's going to be uh, a noxious invasive, um, seeing as you can go in just about any direction from here and find 10. Uh, we also use this as a major food source for us. The berries, or lycopene berries as they're called, have a flavor very similar to tomatoes, and we use it to make our main tomato sauce. So we can get tomato sauce from something that is a perennial that we don't have to plant and that we don't have to fertilize and it actually helps fertilize the system next to it, such as this peach tree here, which is growing just gangbusters, being surrounded by so many nitrogen fixers. Over on the other side, we have a young pear tree, and down at its base, you can see a few sets of lupins, a beautiful nitrogen-fixing flower, and there are edible varieties too. And one good thing to know about these is that research has shown that a planting that includes one-third of the plants being nitrogen fixers will actually be 
nitrogen self-sufficient and not need additional fertilizer. Of course, in my opinion, we don't really have to shoot for that one-third number because we have some other tricks up our sleeve that will help maintain the fertility of our system. A second category of plants that help us fertilize our garden are dynamic nutrient accumulator plants. These are plants that usually have deep tap roots that reach down deep into the soil to bring up nutrients and make them available to our other plants, either when we cut them to make mulch or when they die back naturally in the winter, releasing those nutrients into the top level of soil. These include, for example, the beautiful fennel you see here, the deep tap-rooted ragosa roses next to it, and even the wild lettuces behind it, and this beautiful marshmallow in the center. Belgian endive and chicory and the comfrey you see here are two other great dynamic accumulators. Great dynamic accumulators include chicory, comfrey, cleavers, fennel, ragosa roses, pretty much any deep tap-rooted trees, any alliums, and the sorrels. Our next guild role are insectary plants. These are plants that draw insects and pollinators to the garden, including predatory wasps and other beneficial insects. These garden allies help us pollinate our plants, improving the productivity of our fruit trees, as well as helping us fight off insect pests, and possibly even helping to protect our plants against diseases. These especially include all of our beautiful flowering native plants, mints, and carrot family plants. In our garden, the plants with the most traffic are fennel, yarrow, rugosa roses, anisysa, comfrey, and pennyroyal. Speaking of comfrey yet again, that brings us to our next category, mulch maker plants. Plants like comfrey and this beautiful squash plant here naturally have leaf shapes that keep the garden mulched. The best mulch maker plants like this mallow here produce prolific biomass through the growing season, helping to naturally keep the garden mulched, but they can also be cut in order to make mulch in place. Top mulch makers in our garden include sorrels, blood vein sorrel, comfrey, chicory, walking onions, pokeweed, and aliagnus. Which again brings us to our next guild role, fortress plants, which have a lot of overlap with the last couple of categories. Fortress plants are plants that we can plant on the edges of beds to maintain the structural integrity of our ecosystem. They help keep out weeds and especially wandering grasses. They help maintain the soil over the winter by providing a perennial crop and perennial roots in the ground. And the best fortress plants are multifunction, also acting as insectary plants and mulch makers. Fortress plants come in a few different categories. First, those large-leaved plants that shade out the competitors, like sorrels and comfrey. The next set are woody perennial herbs, which have a relationship with fungi that help keep grasses at bay. And finally, our allelopathic plants, like daffodils or fennel, which can also help keep weeds for out of the garden. And our final variety of plants are ground covers. In a natural ecosystem, these cover the ground, keep it nice and mulched, keep weeds away, and keep nutrients cycling over the winter. These can be a natural green living mulch around your garden crops, like with this kale here, or they can be walkable ground covers that will help keep your paths maintained for you. Here we see a variety of thymes, walking thymes, clovers, and a few other things like creeping chamomile that help keep our paths maintained here at Lily House. Two final categories that I often recommend are ephemeral nutrient cyclers, things that are overwintering ephemerals that keep that water-soluble nitrogen from rinsing out of the garden in the winter and instead captured into green growth. Things like walking onions, wild alliums, um, the yarrow you see here, daffodils, and other spring flowering bulbs. I especially love ramps and Claytonia virginica because they're also edible. 
And finally, I also recommend pest repellent and fumigator plants, such as alliums and daffodils that you see here. These are especially important around fruit trees and other sensitive crops that wildlife would be getting at in the winter while they're hungry. These plants cl planted close to trees do have a real impact in keeping trees protected from things like voles. Here we see a beautiful example of an apricot pear guild, one of the very first things that we planted here when we moved in. We see all of these elements tied in together. We see fortress plantings of lavender, oregano, and woody herbs, as well as some of the thick, leafy ones in the back, keeping the weeds out. Ground covers including the thyme, yarrow, strawberries, alliums, sorrel, all working in there together like a natural ecosystem. Walkable ground covers including thymes and nitrogen fixing clovers. We have other nitrogen fixers in here including the uh, lupins and blue false indigo. We have a variety of fumigator plants keeping pests away such as the daffodils in the spring, walking onions, there are mulch maker plants in here, including valerian and marshmallow, uh, as well as the oregano edging that we chop and drop. We have a variety of vegetables and fruits growing in here too. Mushrooms as another layer in this area. Sorrel, again, is a great chop and drop plant and a mulch maker. Um, Valerian, yarrow, fennel in here, um, chives, also all acting as insectary plants. Oregano is another great insectary plant. Thyme is another great insectary plant. Again, what you see in here is a lot of these plants are multi-purpose. They each fulfill a lot of functions. And when you stack those all together, that is when you get a powerful guild that pops early on, like this one which has required almost no work in the few years that it has been planted here. Another thing to keep in mind is that these guilds tend to look much more naturalistic after a few years, not like the wide spacings with lots of mulch that you see in a lot of the textbook designs. After a few years, these really should be looking like natural ecosystems and natural forest floors. Otherwise, you're going to be doing a lot of extra work to maintain that neat and tidy look. Here's a place in early succession where you do see that kind of mulching just coming in. We are just establishing this guild here with a variety of guild plants trying to get all of our rolls in here and over time we're going to have good ground covers established too. It's a very extensive way of establishing a guild like this and, in, and by the end of the season we should have this just about right so it's going to require very little work to continue on from here. So there you have it, guilds, plantings that function like ecosystems to keep our work down to the minimum and help provide for the health of the whole system. In this example we saw a fruit tree gilded out in classic permaculture style. We can use the same idea of guild roles and guild plantings to help support any kind of central element. In our next video I'll be showing you how we've used that same exact concept to help guild out our annual vegetable gardens. And this is a classic design that goes back uh, to Bill Mullison. That's who I first saw it described by, but I've also seen uh, very similar ideas described and implemented by Jeff Lawton in some of his videos. Uh, and uh, it's one that's worked very well for us here at Lily House. So we'll show you how we did it and how it's worked for us.